Please be seated. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Saxon. Well, welcome to each of you. If you'd like to open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, we have, uh, we mentioned earlier all the events of the month, but they're in your bulletin. If you did not get a bulletin, why, please make sure you get one. And then again, we mentioned for prayer, Tuesday, my sister has shoulder surgery, Judy Fluger in Florida, and uh, she's not as young as she used to be. None of us are, but uh, it's, uh, uh, she's asking for, her, for you to pray for her. And then tomorrow we'll have some tests at Clinton Memorial, so we'll see what happens there. Well, Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, we'll read the first two verses. Our subject is the surety of faith this morning, but Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 and 2. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. I think that we can draw our own ideas about what faith is. We can have our own uh, views of what we think it will do. But I believe we need to get our understanding from the Bible on it because there's a lot of things that depend upon it. As a matter of fact, salvation and God says, this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So wherever we're not having a spiritual victory, then there's a lack of faith that's being put into the picture. You notice in verse 2 it says, for by it the elders. And that's talking about the people that's gone on before us. The people that are already in heaven. The people that we can see all throughout the scripture. And what we see all through the Bible is not that faith makes people all sufficient of themselves. I think that can be a very wrong conclusion, that if you have faith, you're the all-sufficient person. That's not it. That's not the way it works. But what we see is that it is that faith leads man to deny themselves in order to become totally dependent upon God. That's where faith, that's the pathway of faith. It's human pride that glories in being all-sufficient and being able to just, you know, rise above it all, conquer it all, and not be phased by any of it. But that's really the complete opposite of the way God works. Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and there, notice a few verses from this chapter, beginning in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 1. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. And then notice this uh, verse 29, very special verse. That no flesh should glory in his presence. So if faith makes a giant out of a person, that's something they can glory in, and that would be going against what they're supposed to be. So faith is not about making giants out of us. It's about making us dependent upon God. And that's what we're going to look at when it comes to the examples. We have quite a few examples of the elders that we're going to look at. 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So the natural mind, the carnal mind, the human mind, is not going to think about faith like it really is. It's going to think of it in terms of the flesh. It's going to think of it in terms of the person and what they are capable of themselves. So let's look at examples. Going back to, we used this example not too long ago, but... The 12th chapter of Genesis, and we know Abraham. Uh, this is before his name was changed to Abraham. He's still called Abram. But he was called the friend of God. 
Not many people have that title. Uh, in the scripture that's ever been called the friend of God. A man of great faith. And God refers to him over and over again, a man of great faith. So we have in the 12th chapter of Genesis, God calls Abraham in the first verse to get out of your country, to go to a place that I will show you. I will show you. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to show you when you go. And in verse 5, Abram went. He obeyed God. He's in the will of God. He's exercising his faith. But you get into the uh, 11th verse. It came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. You know, we all can have a lot of thoughts about this, and you can uh, think a lot of things about, well, it's not the way I would do it. Well, um, <clears throat> we're not there. We don't know the situation, the circumstances. But looking at this with a fleshly mind, a person might look upon this with disgust, disgust, that a man would not even own up. He's married to this woman. And we might lose all confidence in him. Well, you know, that, that's not the man. But I ask you a question. You notice in verses 14 and 15, sure enough, when Abraham got to Egypt, she was spotted. She was taken into Pharaoh's house. She did not become his wife. God stopped that. But the point I want to make is this. What if Abraham would have gone in to Macho Man with a mean face? Don't anybody look at my wife or I'll destroy you. I'll stomp you to the ground. How long would Abraham or Abram have lasted in view of the great men and powerful men of the government? He wouldn't have lasted. They would have got rid of him right away. So to think that this is all about Abraham being the macho man, making a difference here, that's not it. You know what is it? Verse 17. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. That's where Abram's faith came in. It didn't make him a macho man. It didn't make him capable of taking on the government. But it put him in the hands of God. He didn't know how to handle this thing. And he'd, ha he'd handled it pretty miserably in many ways. But his faith was about, he was totally dependent on God, and God made the difference for him. Well, let's go to Joshua chapter 6. Let's go to Joshua chapter 6. And this is the time that Israel is now beginning to march into Canaan, and the first city they had to conquer was Jericho. <clears throat> well, it tells us in the, first or the sixth chapter of Joshua that Jericho was straightly shut up. Nobody would come in, nobody would go out of Jericho. But in verse 2, the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho. And the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. Ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. It shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Well, that's what they did. So you get into verse 10, and you'll find that Joshua told them, and to me this has always been an amazing verse knowing how people are, but when you're marching around the city, you don't say a word. You don't talk to the guy next to you. 
You just keep totally quiet. It's kind of like how long will a uh, classroom of kids remain silent if you tell them be quiet. And there's always somebody that just cannot contain themselves. They've got to say something. Joshua said, nobody say anything. Everybody be totally quiet. Well, they marched exactly like God said. And so in the 16th verse, when it came time, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. And in verse 20, the people shouted, and when the priest blew the trumpets, it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Their faith was not about becoming great soldiers themselves, to where that they would be able to overpower the forces there at Jericho. Their faith was about becoming totally dependent upon what God told them. And that's how they conquered the city. So again, it wasn't about them. It was about their faith and God responding to it. You go over to the book of Judges, chapter 7, and this is the time of Gideon. <clears throat> and uh, Israel had enemies beyond their ability to control. So Gideon called for an army to come. 33,000 men showed up. And on the first um, way in which God uh, sort of leaned the army down to where it would be totally dependent upon him, the third verse, he said, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him go back. You don't have to fight in this battle. If you have any, any um, feelings about it that you just don't want to be a part of it, go, go back home. Well, <clears throat> there went back 20 and 2,000, and just 10,000 left. And then it came down to the fact that God said, I will prove them yet, take them down to the water, and have them drink, and whosoever laps like a dog laps in the water, those are the ones I will use to save Israel. Only 300 did. Well, my goodness, 300 against an army that was innumerable back in chapter 6. So what was this? This was not about God enabling them to stand up to the enemy armies. It was about their faith in becoming totally dependent upon the way God told them to do it. And they did. And, of course, God gave them the victory. I want to go to another example in 1 Samuel 17. And there in verse 48, 1 Samuel 17 and verse 48. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it, smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. So let's again look at this for what it is. This was not about David being the man above all other men. It's not what this is about at all. This was not about the man, David, who was, um, you know, so great, and about David having such a faith that made him to where he was a giant. It was about David becoming totally dependent upon God. You go back to the 37th verse, and God had given David an experience earlier on that prepared him for this. David said, the Lord that delivered me, the Lord that delivered me, out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. That's total dependence on God. He's not presenting himself as being the giant that can kill the giant, but he said, the Lord that delivered me. 
And then you notice also in verse 45, when David faced this Philistine, David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. So what do you find there? It was God working through David. God had anointed David to be king back in chapter 16. Now God is using David to do what no man could do with themselves, to deliver Israel and to introduce David unto the nation as their leader. Had this not been God's plan, had it not been God delivering David, no amount of courage on David's part would have defeated Goliath. No amount of human courage on his part would have defeated Goliath if it had not been God working. So it is not the man, David, that wrought this victory. It was the faith of David that God used to accomplish his plan. So the message here is not to look to the man, David, but to see that it was his faith in being totally dependent on God delivering him. This is what brought the victory. Going over to the book of Daniel, and I'm sure that these are um, stories that thrill everybody, and they should. But in Daniel, the, the third chapter, and there in verse 14, it says, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Well, going over to verse 21. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their hats, their other garments, and were cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Their deliverance was not anything about what they did as heroic people. They did not flex a muscle. <coughs> they did not make a defiant speech. They did not challenge the king's authority. All they did was maintain their allegiance to God. They maintained their allegiance to God. It was God honoring that faith that changed the outcome, and we're going to look at a verse about that in just a moment. It was not something they were able to do themselves. It was God that did it. Now, if some news reporter had been there, we'll just try to bring it up to date. And so at this point, there has been the exchange between Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying, no, we're not going to serve your gods. Then they're bound and they're thrown into the furnace. Well, if a news reporter had walked out at that point without seeing the end result, it would appear to be such a pitiful performance on the part of these men. You know, they didn't do anything. And they were just, you know, they were just mush in the hands of this king. But, verse 27, verse 27, the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. 
that's what their faith was about. It wasn't about them <clears throat> that they couldn't be burnt of their own. It wasn't about them being able to defy the authority of the king. It was about God made the difference because of their faith. You go over to the sixth chapter of Daniel. There were those that conspired against Daniel. They arranged a deal to where that they knew would be an entrapment of Daniel, to where that uh, the king signed a law that nobody could pray for 30 days, except only ask a, a petition of the king himself. Well, verse 10 of Daniel 6, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his throne three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. As he did aforetime. Daniel made no showing as a man in his own defense. He didn't lift a finger in that way. His adversaries ran all over him. And they succeeded in getting him cast into the den of lions. He looked weak. He looked helpless in comparison to them. Nobody would want to be with him. You know, nobody would want to be on his side. But what happened? Verse 22. My God has sent his angel, has shut the lions' mouths, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocence he was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Daniel did not have a plan ahead of time how he was going to handle this, but there was one thing he had for sure. He was going to maintain his allegiance to God. And you know what? God took care of it. Does that tell us anything? Well, it's not a question of who we are, what we are, what our situations are. It's a question, do we have a faith that God will honor and that God will respond to? You're not going to be able to figure out your life situations many times, but if you determine, I'm going to remain faithful to God, I'm going to remain true to him, your faith will be that which God will honor. In the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we have another situation, one of the elders. 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 11. Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. <coughs> Who's talking here? The king. Okay, <clears throat> this wasn't about Jehoshaphat rising up to challenge the powers <clears throat> and the armies of those who had come against them. It was about his faith. His faith in calling upon and waiting upon God. So in verse 15, he heard a message from the prophet. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid or dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. And down in verse 20, <coughs> Jehoshaphat relayed this to the people. Believe in the Lord your God. So shall ye be established. Believe his prophets. So shall ye prosper. So look back to verse 12 now. Here's the king. We don't know what to do. We don't have a plan. We don't have the ability. God, we're just calling on you. You know, you can look at that guy. Oh, boy. He's a poor excuse for a king. He didn't have a plan. He's a failure at leadership. Or you could thank God for his faith. You do one or the other. Well, <clears throat> I think we know which one was the right course. So in verse 15, the battle is not yours, but God's. I think that raises a question, what battle are we fighting? Are we fighting our own battle? Or are we fighting God's battle? 
That's a good question. To have God for us, we must be fully surrendered to and dependent upon him. In the 27th chapter of Matthew, <clears throat> excuse me, Matthew chapter 27, and there in verse 39, Matthew 27, 39. They that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. <clears throat> the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Who is this that they're talking about? Could that possibly be the almighty son of God? What if you had come from a far country and you were looking for the king of kings? Would you be enthusiastic about bowing before him as he was hanging there on the cross? Would you feel a burst of pride in him as you looked upon his abused, broken body? Would you accompany him to the cross as your personal hero? Or would you forsake him and flee? You know, we uh, like to criticize. We like to lift ourselves above others and say, I wouldn't do that. But I believe if we would have been in the same position with the other disciples, we would have done exactly what they did. You know why? They did not watch and pray. That's the reason it happened to them. It wasn't because they were a bunch of misfits. They just did not watch and pray. So here's the point. To look at appearance, to make conclusions from human expectations, you would see miserable failure when you looked upon that one hanging on the cross. But it was Christ's faith that led to him being crucified for us. It wasn't personal failure. No doubt there were many that continued to hold him in contempt, even after he arose from the dead because the lie went out, he didn't really arise. And it would not be because of what he was, but because of what they chose to hold in their hearts toward him. You know, that's a big point. The hatred that demanded Christ's crucifixion was a chosen hatred. It was a hatred without a cause, as you read in John chapter 15. So hatred without a cause has always existed. It continues to exist toward those who serve the Lord. Christ said it would be that way. He said, you're not greater than I am. If they've hated me, they'll hate you. They'll hate you. And, of course, it was because they refused to reconcile with God in what they were and what they were doing. John 8, 42 said, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth from and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Now I want to get back to Hebrews 11 again. And there in verse 1, when it tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is complete trust and reliance upon God. It is not a favorable opinion of what a person might draw from looking, but it is a total dependence. It is by faith that we're able to rise above all of our doubts and all of our misgivings. I want to go to 1 John chapter 5, and as this talks about where we draw our assurance, in 1 John chapter 5, and there in verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of, of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believed, uh, believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life, he that hath not the son of God hath not life. 
These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. All right, think about what it's saying here. We receive the witness of men all the time. We're getting close to the Christmas season. You may already know what you're getting. You know, uh, I think it's good that you don't try to tell your kids that some fictitious big old fat man brought you the gifts, but you tell them where they came from and why, and that is you love them. So you may know already what your gifts are, and let's just say you're going to get a significant gift. You know what it is. You can be happy about it before you get it. Why? Because of your trust in the person that said, I'll get it for you. You can also be thinking about how you're going to use it. And it might be still 20 days away before you get it. But you can be thinking about that. Why? You receive the witness of men. All right. God, his word, is more sure than any promise of man. You know, you may rely upon your mother or your father or somebody that they're going to give you something because they said they would. What if they die? What if suddenly there is a financial collapse and they can't do it? Well, God's not going to die. God's not going to have, he's not going to lose all of his money in the stock market. So there is no chance of God failing. But there is a chance of somebody's promise failing. But we'll put confidence in the fact that somebody tells us they're going to do something for us. Why can't we put our confidence in what God says? There's nothing more sure than God's word. You know, when Paul referred to his assurance of salvation, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, he did not refer to the bright light. He did not refer to the fact he fell to the earth. He did not refer to the fact that he was without sight for three days. He referred to one thing in 2 Timothy 1.12. I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. God's word told him that if he accepted Christ and he believed on him with all of his heart, that he was saved. And he said, that's where my assurance is. Not in me, not in that bright light, not in that fall to the earth, not in those three days without sight, but the fact, I know whom I have believed. Well, God's word says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And the same word that promises to save the one who accepts Christ as his Savior and Lord is the same word that assures us that he saves a believer. You know, God doesn't give us a double message there. He says, You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, this is not to a casual person that is out there drinking their beer and somebody talks to them about going to heaven. Oh, yeah, I want to go. I'm okay. Not that at all. It's a person with all of their heart that is turning to the Lord for salvation, turning to him, knowing they're a sinner, knowing that Christ died and atoned for their sins, and knowing he offered his righteousness to God that they can be accepted, and with all of their heart they accept that. They believe that. God says the same word that tells you how to be saved is a word that tells you that when you do accept him, you are saved. There isn't going to be a double message. There's not going to be a telegram from heaven. There's not going to be some earth-shattering event. It's a matter we accept the witness of God. We accept his witness. God honors all faith in his word. Why doubt the one that loves us the most. You know, there's no greater love than the love of our Savior. Why should we doubt him? May we bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, as we come to you this morning, we're thankful that through your word we can have faith.
Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It is not a matter of the flesh. It is a matter of truly accepting you with all of our heart in what you say. And I pray, Father, that if there's someone here that needs to, with a heart, believe, and with the mouth, make confession unto salvation, I pray that this would be the very day that that person would take you at your word and would accept your witness and just seal the matter in their heart like Paul did. I know whom I have believed. And I pray also for each of us that we would not get confused on what faith is about and start looking for it in places where it is not and start expecting it to be something that it is not but realizing it's when we're totally dependent upon you, not knowing ourselves what to do, but totally dependent upon you, you will honor that faith. And so I pray that you'll give the invitation for us in Jesus' name we offer our prayer.